It's difficult to view the world outside our human context. Staying alive and paying the bills both require our attention squarely fixed on our own business. Our sprawling cities and suburbs are wonderful and frightening tributes to creative self-absorption. In them, we spend our micro-scheduled days bustling between work and the endless detail of our private lives, turning in our moments of rest to the buzzing distractions of television and computers, all accelerating towards some ultimate unseen fulfilment of convenience and hyper-reality. Little encourages us to pause and look around, much less question the end goal of our busyness. Anything slower than the quick cuts of TV commercials is overwhelmed by our impatience and short attention. Unfortunately, we might be missing something important to our happiness and to our survival. The opening quote this week comes from the book The Sacred Earth, Writers on Nature and Spirit by Jason Gardner. Welcome to Surviving the Matrix, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maxwell Egan. It's a pleasure to be with you once again, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Having spent many years of my life living on the outside of society, I was a musician for most of my younger years, and I had a few odd jobs around the place. I worked building film sets on and off for about seven years as well. But I never had what would be termed a straight job. I never had a nine-to-five job. Even working on film sets is definitely not a normal job. You're working odd hours in irregular places, and you're building irregular, unusual things, hanging out with unusual people. And it's definitely not mainstream, but essentially what I did through most of my life was I spent my time living on the outside of society. My home life was quite troubled, and I was taking time off school and spending a lot of time by myself from around about the age of 12. And I was living on and off hippie communes from around about 16 or 17 years old. My greatest love of my childhood was music, and so I naturally gravitated towards music and ended up playing in bands and doing front-of-house mixing for bands for many, many years. And so, again, I was essentially living on the outside of society. I wasn't filling in tax forms and working regular hours or paying tax to the government or anything like that. I was working cash-in-hand jobs and living off my art and living off my own abilities, either from playing guitar or my ability to be able to hear what music should sound like. And I actually got quite a lot of work as a sound engineer because good sound engineers are quite hard to come by. And even if I say so myself, I was a very good sound engineer. So I never found myself out of work for years and years, and I managed to tour around the place and travel a lot and meet lots of people from different walks of life and different lifestyles And that's one of the beautiful things about music. One of the really wonderful things about it is that it opens doorways because everybody listens to music. It doesn't matter whether you're a pauper or whether you're a prince. Most people listen to music. And if you are a halfway decent musician, then it opens doorways because everybody wants to meet the musician. Everybody wants to talk to you. So you get to talk to lots of different people from lots of different walks of life. And if you're astute and if you're a people person, then you can gain insights that normal people aren't able to get simply because of the barriers that being a musician breaks down. People are very much themselves when they talk to musicians. They don't put on any airs. They often feel humbled in the presence of a good musician and so they tend to open up to you a lot easier than they would someone who had a different job. I don't know what it is but there's just something about music which breaks down these barriers and so I was always able to meet people from that standing and from that perspective. So I really got to know a lot of people that I met and see a real side of them. I didn't see the side of the elite that was elite. I didn't see the side of the pauper that was poor. What I saw was the real person within that shell. 
I mean, I've even had situations in workplaces when I was working building film sets. There were certain individuals that I'd meet and we would clash. There'd be a clash of personalities and these people were very much the bully and just didn't like me. I didn't know why, but they just didn't like me. But then we would get together sometimes after work and you'd find that there'd be a drummer in the crew and there'd be a bass player in the crew and there'd be a keyboard player in the crew. So we'd all bring our stuff to work and we'd set up on one of the stages that we were building, some of the film sets that we were building, and we'd set up and we'd have an after work party and we'd all jam for the afternoon. And simply because I could play guitar, suddenly these people who didn't like me before viewed me from a different angle, said, oh, okay, well, maybe you're not so bad. And then they'd open up to me and I'd be able to talk to these people and I'd start to understand why they viewed the world the way they do, why they were bullies, what the chips were that they had on their shoulder, what had led them to that point. They would open right up to me simply because I was able to play an instrument. So it does break down barriers and it was a very interesting lifestyle and a very educational lifestyle. For all of the complaints that you hear when people say musicians live meaningless lifestyles, really they don't. Very often they live quite philosophical lifestyles. And that's what my life as a musician was. It was a great learning experience for me. Admittedly, I was my own worst enemy for many, many years, but this is how we grow. And having done all that and having lived my life in that manner, it caused me to look at things from a different perspective to most other people. And it gave me a very broad view of what people are and why certain people think the way they do. Because how you view society is basically determined by which social class you grow up in. And you'll find that many of the elites, for want of a better word, grow up in a particular social class that never gives them the ability to look at the world from the perspective of someone who lives at the bottom of the food chain. And this is quite understandable. They simply can't comprehend what it would be like to look at the world from that perspective. It's kind of like the prince and the pauper syndrome, because it's very, very difficult for a rich person to comprehend what life is like as a poor person just as much as it is for a pauper to be able to view life from the perspective of someone who lives a very opulent lifestyle. They may try, they may imagine what it would be like to be rich, but they can't imagine the mentality that these people have simply because of the social class that they've been raised in. And it's the same for each social class. And that's why it's very difficult to judge people. I think people need more understanding than judgment, and what we need to do is find a way of merging the understanding and merging the comprehension, merging the consciousness of these classes So each one is able to look at each other from an empathetic perspective rather than a judgmental perspective. You know, you may look at the elite and say, well, what what do you want me to be empathetic with this person for? And don't get the word wrong. Empathy is simply understanding something from that perspective. It has nothing to do with sympathy. I'm not asking you to sympathize with the plight of a rich person or a tyrant. Certainly not. But what you need to do is have empathy for that person so that you are able to view the world from their perspective to help you understand why they think the way they do. And it's the same with every class. If you are someone who lives a very opulent lifestyle, you need to have empathy for the very poor people in order to understand what reality is like from their perspective. And this can only be achieved through empathy. Empathy is one of the most important senses that we have and it is a sense that we've forgotten about and people will say well no it isn't a sense it's it's a it's a way of thinking well really i view it as a sense to be able to view the world from the perspective of someone else to be able to walk a mile in someone else's shoes and see the world through their eyes i think this is very very important because when we can do that it begins to bridge the consciousness gap between the classes and by doing so We begin to understand people enough to be able to respect them no matter how wrong they've been and to help us begin to comprehend how to approach these people and how to approach reality and how to apply this new understanding to the world in which we live. Now very often you've probably heard me say that we could change the world in three seconds if we all changed our perspective and as you'll notice I finish every show I have for the last six years with the two words in la cash. Now, in la cash can be loosely translated as I am another yourself, which of course could also be interpreted as we are each other. But 
it isn't just these two words and it isn't just this understanding. It's a way of life. It's an emotional journey. It's a whole new perspective on how to view reality. And the reason I finish each show with these words in Lakesh is because of the understanding it conveys. And it's really been the message of this show, Surviving the Matrix, right since its inception. And I think the understanding that in Lakesh conveys is important simply because it does address this issue of class division. Because the class division isn't just between the elites and the paupers. It also exists at every level within the social scale of our society, even within people of the same class, in inverted commas, people of the middle class. There's the lower middle class, the middle middle class, and the upper middle class, all these different classes. And then within the lower middle class, there's competition to be part of the next class up to be closer to the middle middle class and in there there's competition to be closer to the upper middle class and in the upper middle class there's competition to become an elite even if it's just within your class so there's all of this competition based on your amount of material gain the amount of economic value you've been able to add to your existence through your existence. You know, in all of our life and all of the structure of our society and all the way we view each other and the way we view people within the classes is all based on their economic achievements. And so we don't view people from an empathetic perspective. We view them from an economic perspective. And there's the problem right there. And even when we are attempting to stand up against this system and we attempt to address those that we might term to be elite, we tend to view them from their social standing. We don't approach them as people, human beings, sui generis human beings, living entities within a vessel who have a particular perspective of reality and who may not know the way we view the world. They may not ever have taken the time to be able to even attempt to see the world through the eyes of someone who is not themselves, simply because they were raised in that environment. And they weren't raised to think about such things. They were raised to believe that they are elite. They are different to the general run-of-the-mill people. And they're trained to think this way very often. They think this way because they're programmed to think this way. And they have particular lifestyles which get them caught up in these affairs of state and these affairs of business and the affairs of, of whatever they're doing. Very often, very opulent lifestyles. It's always just fun and glitz and glamour. And it's always been that way since birth. And they never really stop to think because they're never put in a position where they have to. They're never put in a position where it's comfortable for them to do so and they're never put in a position where they even have time to do so, simply because they're raised to be the way they are. Even in the movie The Prince and the Pauper, you notice the prince had no concept of what it was like to be a pauper until he went down onto the street and actually experienced what it was like. But the thing is, it also works in the reverse direction. We may sit here and scream and shake our fists at the elite for what they do. But again, we're not viewing them from an empathetic perspective. And so very often we have absolutely no idea what it is like to view the world through their eyes. And that's what we need to do in order to be able to address the problem. This has nothing to do with giving these people sympathy. This is simply helping you understand how the minds of these people work. And what I'm saying here is when we approach people, when we approach the legal system, when we approach the government, when we approach those that we term elite or elitist, we need to always be aware that what they are is a frequency of consciousness inhabiting a vessel. They are sui generis, the same as us. And because we respect our own nature and our own state of being sui generis, and we can view the world from the perspective of in la cash, Whereas I am another yourself, we are literally each other viewing the world from a different perspective. Then we can treat them and converse with them with the respect that we would want for ourselves. 
that's the thing, you know. I mean, it may get difficult. You may get arrested. You may get locked up. They may intimidate you. They may want you to sign things. There may be a certain process that you have to go through. But I firmly believe that if you maintain your stance and maintain your respectful nature through the entire process, you're going to be okay. It's when you start fighting and when you start arguing and when you start dueling with these people that things go wrong. But if you are always of a respectful nature and you are always in a position where you respect your living flesh, the quality and the rights of your living flesh, but you also respect that in others, then truth and right will always prevail. Of course, it may be a little difficult at the moment in places such as Queensland, Australia, where it seems that flesh has no rights. But in most cases, I firmly believe that this is the way to deal with this entire system. And I really believe that it has to be dealt from this perspective in every single aspect of this society. Any type of social hierarchy we're dealing with, any type of legal situation we're dealing with, any type of government or control system that we're dealing with, we have to remember that what we're dealing with is people. Usually they are public trustees who are actually public servants who are supposed to do what we say. We don't have to do what they say. But we forget that we are living flesh. We forget that they are living flesh. We get drawn into argument. We get drawn into the corporate world without even knowing that we're doing so because we don't truly understand the language that we're speaking. And I addressed a lot of this on the previous two episodes of Surviving the Matrix. So if you don't get what I'm saying about the words and the word magic and how we don't understand our language, I urge you to go back and listen to those two shows. And these shows were from memory, I think, entitled Taking Back the World and How You Are Enslaved and Why You Don't Know It. But if we can gain a real understanding of our language and gain a real understanding of what we are and look at the world through empathetic eyes, even if we are dealing with our enemy, you still need to have empathy for that person so you are able to look at the world through their eyes, from their perspective, in order that you may comprehend this person's motives and this person's view of the world and begin to understand why they are doing what they're doing because that will give you the tools that you need to be able to stand against what they're doing. Because if you can stand in the power of your flesh, you'll find that flesh usually deactivates any corporate situation, because corporatism cannot deal with flesh. One of the most important things this system has done is cause people to forget their flesh, and to train people to believe that they are their name, that they are a corporate entity, and therefore part of the corporate world and subject to the rules of the corporate system. That is the number one most important thing that this system has done to human consciousness. It's caused people to forget themselves and to view themselves from a corporate perspective, a business perspective, and to view everybody else from that perspective as well in their appraisal of the people around them. As I said, everybody is always appraised by their economic value which all goes back to the corporate system and all of it is fiction and all of it is designed to lead you away from any true knowledge of yourself and the power that comes from that knowledge. Even if you are a religious person, Christ said one of the most important things that people should do is to know thyself. And that is for very good reason, ladies and gentlemen, because it is in thyself that all of the answers lie. Once you discover the power of your flesh and the power of what your consciousness is actually capable of, when it learns how to take responsibility of itself and take control of its own existence, and that's the most important things that this system has caused us to forget. And really that's what it is, folks. It's a great forgetfulness, a great sleepiness that is over human consciousness. And that's what this time in history is. It's a great wakefulness. That's what they say to people. He woke up. Because that's what you do. You wake up to who and what you are. And wake up to the reality of what we are caught up in. And once you become aware of it, then you can't do nothing. It becomes impossible to do nothing. Because once you're awake, it's impossible to go back to sleep. Once you see the matrix and see the system for what it is, and see through the veil of illusion that has been pulled over human consciousness it becomes impossible to maintain an existence within that corporate world to any degree of comfort at all. And it's tricky because we all have to 
maintain some sort of connection with the corporate system because we are all required to pay in order to be alive. Therefore, we have to gather paper. Therefore, we have to create some sort of a mechanism by which we can garner economic value to ourselves. And usually we have to do this at the expense of other people. It's always been that way. We have to start some sort of a business or work for somebody or do something in order to garner paper so that we can pay to be alive. And any art that we create, anything that we produce ourselves, we are required to sell it to people. So we've been removed from our natural propensity to give to people. Now we can't do that because of the economic model that's been superimposed over our consciousness. I mean, sure, we can still make things and give them away, but very often we simply can't afford to because time is money. And if we make something, well, we've spent time doing that that we weren't spending earning a living. And so therefore, usually we are required to sell our art rather than simply give it. And we are quite literally forced to operate within a corporate system, whether we disagree with it or not, whether we can see through it or not. It's irrelevant. You still have to do it because while other people are still locked within the corporate system and believe that that is what reality is, then the rest of the world is forced to go along with them. Simply because of the way the corporate system now controls all the resources of the planet. And by resources, I mean food, air, water, and of course the people, because the people are the most valuable resource on the planet. And the attention of the people and the belief of the people what idea people have about what reality is. This is the most important thing to control. Human beings are the most valuable resource because it is human beings that extract all the other resources and everything we extract is for human beings anyway. So it's really all about that. And if you can control what people think and you can control what people believe they are capable of and what sort of an idea of reality people have, then you can control the world. And you see, that's how it's done, folks. And really, the whole control grid that's in place, as I've so often said, it's only there because people believe that it's there. And one of the most effective things about the control grid is the division of our society, which, again, is because of the lack of empathy that people feel for each other and the lack of empathy that exists between the classes. People simply can't comprehend what it's like to view the world through somebody else's eyes. They can't imagine what it's like to be someone different to who they are. And something that I've found which has been most revealing is that people are very much aware of their own uniqueness, but they very rarely see that uniqueness in others. I mean, some people do, but most people don't. Most people view themselves as being the center of their own universe and the rest of the world of being just people. There are some people that they get along with, there are some people they don't get along with, but basically it's just a sea of people. And they generally view themselves as being completely separate to everybody else. And we are separate in as much as we have our own unique perspective. But the real thing about that and the real thing to get your head around is that we are also all completely the same in our uniqueness. We are all sui generis, we are all unique, we are all completely different, but we are the same in that difference. And this is what we fail to look at when looking at the social standing of people. When we look at the elite, when we look at the ruling hand, when we look at police officers or the legal system or lawyers or anybody that we view as a figure of authority, anybody that we see from a different class than us, we don't view them as having the same uniqueness and the same value as us. Very often we view them as having lesser or greater value or of being more or less important, or of being more or less an authority figure. But really, we are all just the same. And the only thing that makes us different is our individual uniqueness. Naturally unique because we each inhabit a different and completely unique vessel for the experience, which of course is characterized by our own unique perspective of reality. Now the reason I've gone through all of this today and this discussion of empathy and this concept of viewing things through the eyes of other people, I'm not doing this in order to be sympathetic or as an apologist for psychopaths or the behavior of psychopaths. What I've attempted to do in bringing you this information is attempt to help people view things from a more even perspective because we have a real need to address the situation on this planet. We have a real need to pay attention to this control system. 
But every time we attempt to do it, we do it from a confrontational perspective. We go to court, we fight with people, we argue with people. We want to take the system on. Even when we get armed with some of the legal knowledge that people have been giving you, people go out with their guns blazing and they want to take the system on. They want to go into court and they want to fight the judge. They want to fight the system and they want to win. They want to show the system, hey, I beat you. But really what I'm attempting to help you understand is that the system's fiction. If you're going to go into court and you're going to waste energy fighting a system which is essentially fiction, then how competent do you think you are to go into court and actually be yourself? And that's the thing. Are you going to be yourself or are you going to represent yourself? We go into court and we say, I'm free. I'm a free man. I don't need your help. I'm competent. And yet here you are arguing with a system which is fiction. Why are you even there as the name? Why are you even representing yourself in court when you don't have to represent yourself because you are yourself? Why are you even looking at the system as something that has any hold over you at all? Why are you looking at things from that perspective? Is that the act of a sane and rational mind? Because if you claim incompetence and you're fighting against the cloud, then how competent are you? That's the thing, you see. So there's no good going in there and being confrontational. There's no good being confrontational with police officers and being confrontational with the system because the system's fiction. All you've got to do is get it to establish its authority over you, which it can't do if you ask the right questions. But you've got to remember to know your language and know that you're speaking English and don't get sucked into legalese. Don't go down that pathway. Inform them that you're speaking English and you're attaching English meanings to all of their words. And don't get sucked into the path of legalese and never agree to understand anything they say. Because as soon as you understand, you stand under. This is, again, how the language works. That's one of the first things that people who look into this sort of stuff realize is words like understand, which means to stand under what I say, stand under what I just said. And really, folks, if you're going to understand anything or stand under anything, what you should be standing under is the knowledge of the power of your flesh and the power of human consciousness to create, the power of your ability to create any reality you want to, should you choose to participate. That's ultimately the only thing you should stand under, is the understanding of yourself. And you certainly shouldn't be standing under somebody else's idea of what reality is and somebody else's idea that they have authority over you. Especially not a system that we created to service our needs, which is staffed by public servants that we place in positions of trust to act on our behalf. Now, like I've said on so many shows, I don't bring you this information because I want you to go out and create a confrontation. I don't bring you this information because I want you to get into trouble with the system. I bring you this type of information in an attempt to help people remember themselves, remember who and what they are, remember that they are flesh and blood. And that the whole system is a creation of us. You know, we created it. It's just a meme. It's just an idea. It's a system that we created to manage our infrastructure and to serve our best interests. But it's no longer doing that. It's trashing the planet. It's, it's trashing the human race. And it's doing so because people simply don't know who and what they are. That's why I always come back to this so much. I mean, there's so many things that we're facing here, folks. And there's so many movements out there that are attempting to change things. But we're always petitioning people and approaching governments and voting people in and voting people out. We're always using the paper to try to get our message across. But we don't ever get anywhere. And you think we would have learned by now that we're never going to get anywhere because it's designed that way. We've got to step above it and see what the system is. And we have to question it in the right way. But you're not going to be able to do that until you understand what you are, until you understand that you're flesh. And that's why I always come back to this so much. And I've said this in so many ways on so many shows in an attempt to help people realize this about themselves. I figure if I say it in a million different ways, well, each way that I say it, it may reach one more person and the penny may just drop. And the more people wake up, then the more people we have speaking out about this, and that's a good thing. Because once you do wake up to what reality is, speaking out about it becomes mandatory. It just becomes what you do. Because once you know how things work, and once you can see the control grid and see where it's going and what they're putting in place, well, you have to speak out because the other option is to do nothing. And we can't do nothing. And folks, after years of research, I truly believe that the only thing we can do against this system is to rediscover ourselves. I really believe this. I don't think there is any political remedy, any legal remedy. I don't think it will be achieved through violent revolution and overthrow of any government. I think really what it comes down to is 
people simply changing their perspective and changing the way they deal with the people around them. I've been saying this for years and I truly do believe that this is the best solution that we have. You know, the power of a strong community is a formidable force. It really is. The power of a strong community that is equipped with the most powerful weapon on the earth, which is truth. Because once you are equipped with the truth, the truth about yourself, the truth about reality, the the truth of yourself, because you are truth. Just the fact that you are here and you are conscious, this is an amazing truth in itself. And everybody holds that one truth, the truth of their own being. And once we can see that in ourselves and see that in others and therefore respect each other, then the whole system ceases to exist. In that moment, we become free. That's the thing, you know. We're tricked into all of this stuff. We're tricked into all this corporatism. We're tricked into the illusion of ownership, the fraud of ownership. I mean, ownership is the greatest fraud that's ever been perpetrated against human consciousness, the mere concept that you could possess something or even possess someone that is not yourself is absolutely amazing. And it's a fraud because you can't possess anything. You're only here in a temporary existence. You don't even truly possess your body. You're just a custodian of it. You're just a custodian of your body and you should look after it so that it serves you well. And you may also be the custodian of a certain place on the earth, a certain piece of land. But you don't own either one of these things. The entire concept of ownership is simply a fraud that has been created in order to perpetuate division and in order to transfer the control of the planet into other people's hands because people can't steal the earth and trick everybody else into believing that they own the earth until they can trick people into believing that ownership is real. And as I've said before, folks, if they can trick you into thinking that you can own part of the earth and then enslave you to a corrupt monetary system which is designed to implode, then what you believe you own will transfer into someone else's ownership and then you'll believe that they own it when really nobody can own the earth. So the whole thing's a fraud and the whole thing's based on a lie and it's all based on your perspective of who and what you are and what this reality is and what the world is, what your relationship to the world is, what your relationship to this planet is and what your relationship to everybody else is. And if we could change our perspective and start to think this way and just view the world from a different perspective to what we do and actually respect each other, then as I said, in that one moment, the entire system would collapse. It would just simply cease to exist. Because it's only a meme now. It only exists in our minds. And it isn't until we change our minds and change what we believe is possible and change the way we view the world that we're going to have any impact against this system. We have a fictional, etheric system that only exists as a fiction in the ether, and yet it is able to control the physical world. And it's able to do that through our belief that the system is real. But... When we attempt to address the system, we don't address it from its root source, which is in the ether, because we're trained to only really acknowledge the physical, and so that's where we attempt to address the system within the physical, but we can't ever really address it from that perspective because it only exists within the ether. Our response to this system is always purely physical because we don't acknowledge the etheric as even existing. That's the thing, you know, we're we're operating within a physical world attempting to repel a fictional system. I mean, sure, we need to participate in the physical world, but we need to participate by building strong ties with our community around us and helping the world be a better world, not by fighting the system by sending reams of paper into government and believing that we can go up against it using its own laws, because we can't. Even with what I'm attempting to do with the Attorney General, the Queensland Attorney General in Australia, it's doubtful I'll have success, but I'm going to try it anyway. But it's doubtful that I'll have success within the parameters of that system until I can find a way to step above the system and simply hold them in breach of trust, which is why I addressed it from that perspective. Because you've got to deal with this system from the perspective of a real, living, flesh human being. You can't deal with it 
in the physical world. You have to deal with it in the energetic world. You have to deal with it by changing your mindset and changing your perspective of what the system is and what you are. And if you've been working in the physical world to build strong ties with your community around you, then you're going to have that support from your community because they also know who you are, because they know who they are, because you've helped them come to this realization about themselves through your actions by leading an example in all that you do. And this is something that we can all do in all of our communities. See, that's how we have to address it. There is no legal remedy. There is no social remedy. There is no political remedy. There's nothing we can do within that paper-based reality to deal with this problem because the problem is the paper-based reality itself. The problem is that it is fiction. And you can't find a way through that fiction to deal with the fiction. Why would you be doing that? Why would you be looking for a remedy to fiction within the fiction itself? And this is what I've been attempting to help people comprehend when I've been bringing all this sort of stuff to your attention on the show for so many years. You know, I really believe that the biggest problem is that people have forgotten themselves. They've mistaken themselves for being something other than what they really are. They've mistaken culture for lifestyle when culture should be art. It should be the art of your life, the art of your existence. But what we have now is certain types of social culture and basically systems that have been put in place in each country in order to create differences and make people very aware of their differences between different cultures, in inverted commas. So culture has been moved away from what it should be, which would be an artistic expression of creation. The way you hold yourself, the way you move, the way you eat, the way you dress, the art that you create, the way you grow your crops, the way you build your houses, this is your culture. But it's been replaced by this whole concept of social status, which is simply not real. It's an illusion. So we've had so many things put in place to lead us away from the true reality of ourselves and the truth of ourselves. And that's the problem. You know, there's so many people that are speaking out about this system. There's so many steps that are being taken to shake our fists at it. But there's very few who are looking at the root cause and realizing that the solution to all of the things that we view as being external to ourselves lies within ourselves. It lies in changing our heart space and changing our view of what we are and how we interact with people around us. And I've beat this drum almost to death on the show here for the last six years because that's the solution, ladies and gentlemen. If we could simply respect each other, don't expect other people to give you any more respect than you give them. Don't expect other people to be able to see your perspective of what the world is or how the world should be. But just move into your heart and do the right thing in all that you do. Lead by example in everything that you do. Don't comply with any legislation that interferes with your moral compass Always stand up and question authority when it is not just authority, but always do it from the perspective of a flesh and blood human being dealing with another sui generis flesh and blood human being. And we can solve this situation. And it is getting out there too. The whole concept of sui generis is out there getting in the collective consciousness. Someone sent me a text the other day and it said, Hey Max, I don't know whether you are a fan of JLo, but I just saw an interview where J-Lo was informing someone from the entertainment industry that they were sui generis and using the term to explain to these people that they were one of a kind. So here we go, folks. Now we have people even in the pop industry talking about the concept of sui generis. So it is becoming part of the collective consciousness. The hundredth monkey is beginning to kick in. And I think we're going to see this in many aspects as we move forward in this year. I think this is going to be a very exciting year, folks. I really do. And I think that once the Full Circle Project gets into swing and we start implementing some local initiatives, we're going to see a lot of change happening in the world. I think there's going to be a lot of people that want to get involved in this because everybody does see the problem now. And everyone's looking for the doorway out of this situation. And the doorway really is... In those two words, sui generis, knowing who you are, knowing that you are unique and realizing that everybody else is the same, realizing that we are all in this together. And if we put down our stuff and view each other as all being sui generis, 100% unique, 100% ourselves and absolutely one of a kind in our perspective of reality, 
then we can change the world very, very quickly. And that's what I hope to achieve this year. But again, it's going to take the involvement of the people. So I do urge people to get involved in these type of initiatives this year, folks. Get involved in anything that empowers your community. Get involved in anything that empowers yourself and anything that gives you the knowledge that you need to truly understand yourself, the knowledge to stand in your own power and live to express the art of your life. Find out what it is that you love to do and do as much of that as you possibly can. I think it's so important for people to do that. Do not forget yourself through life and do not forget your dreams and your hopes and your aspirations and do these things. If you've got things in your mind that you've never done and you've always wanted to do, ask yourself why. Why haven't you done them? You should go and do them. You should go and do them right now. Well, perhaps listen to the end of the show and then go and do them. And sure, maybe there are financial barriers which prevent you from doing some of the things that you want to do. I mean, this is going to be a reality for most people, especially in our current state of austerity and the further austerity measures that are being implemented. But I'm sure there's still ways of doing things. And I think that if people change their perspective of reality and change their perspective of how they interact with the world around them, then they'll find that things will just fall into place. It may not be exactly the way you planned, but I'm sure that you'll find things will fall into place anyway. The thing is, you know, we really do have a situation on this planet. And that's really what all of this is about. That's what the shows have been about right since the beginning. And the purpose of the shows, really why I always look at this spiritual and community stuff is because the purpose of the shows is to empower you. I really want the people who listen to the show to be able to view reality from a different perspective because I believe that if they can do that, that's where the solutions lie. Because you become empowered. See, it's the disempowerment of of people which is the real problem. And there's simple steps that can be taken to empower people, I think, because I believe that most of the disempowerment that people feel is simply because they don't understand how reality really works. Actually, the second show that I did in the new series here called The Energetic Universe was an attempt to explain reality to people, to explain a way they could view themselves and a perspective they could have of themselves and of others which would serve to empower them because this is what I've found in my life. I've found that because I understand how reality works, I understand truly what I am, then it empowers me. I don't feel that anything is a threat to me and I I just feel that I can get through any situation simply because I have this understanding, this, this perspective of how reality works that I'm able to apply to my life. And I think it's important that people change their perspective of what they are because like I said, we do have a very serious situation on this planet and it very much needs our attention. But it's not going to happen. People are never going to give it their attention until they first discover themselves and discover the power they can have by giving their attention to something. Now, what our governments are doing simply cannot go on. We can't allow these wars to continue. We can't allow the destruction of our water and the destruction of our countries and our environment to continue. What's happening here in Australia, I think things are about to get very ugly in Australia. It would appear that most of Queensland has been sold to be used as a mine. And over the next few years, I think people are really going to find out why myself and so many other people have been sounding the warning bells for so long. Because if we don't take the opportunity that we've been presented with now to stand up and change the world, then what is happening and the true extent of the damage that's being done and the direction this world is going is going to become so apparent within the next couple of years. It's going to be so much in people's faces that people won't have any other choice but to wake up. And they're going to see why we were ringing the warning bells for so long. But it still doesn't have to get that way. We still have a possibility to change things if we could just unite the people. And that's the hardest part of all, is uniting the people. I mean, I've even tried to unite the neighbours where I live, and it's very difficult. People are just caught in their own 
worlds, which is very understandable. But the real problem is that people just don't know how to give and they don't know how to believe in themselves, truly believe in themselves. Because if you do believe in yourself, then you don't view others so harshly. You really don't. I mean, I know you can take on this type of an attitude and you can turn yourself into a victim. It's a it's an ugly world out there and there are people that do ugly things sometimes. But that still doesn't mean you should give up on humanity and you should stop reaching out to people and you should stop viewing people as being essentially good in their souls and, and basically good from their starting point. I, mean, I don't believe that we're a world of sinners. I don't believe that we are born with evil intentions. I mean, sure, there are psychopaths that are born, and they're born psychopathic. But even psychopaths, I don't think, have consciously evil intentions. I don't think people get up and say, gee, I'm going to make the world bad today. I'm going to go out of my way to make things worse for everybody. I don't think that psychopaths even consider their actions half the time. They just act without empathy. And the result is a psychopathic situation. The result is someone harvesting energy from somebody else because they are unable to to feel empathy for that person. They view themselves as being the top of the food chain, the only truly human thing on the planet. And that's just the way they think. But I don't think it's a, a conscious choice to be evil. I think that's just the way these people are. But I think most people, I think common everyday people, are basically good. I think they're basically caring, they're basically giving. They're all potentially good, caring, honest people. And all of them are born with value, but they've been taught to discard that value and to not see that value, just, just not even be aware of the value, not even discard it because you have to be aware of something in order to discard it. And these people are not even aware of the true value of themselves. They judge themselves by external parameters that are given to them by this system. And so that's the way they judge everybody else as well. But I think we can get rid of all this. We can get through all of this and we can see things differently once we understand ourselves and that's why I put so much attention on this because we do folks we've got a serious situation here we've got to rein our public trustees in Australia is about to get turned into a mine they're cutting a hole through the barrier reef they're bringing in legislation which is basically making it illegal to be in a group of any more than two people if you're in any type of organization at all and you're in a group of three people or more, and you've been named by the government as being of interest, then you can be arrested and put in jail for virtually no crime at all, simply for hanging out with your friends, going and saying hello to someone. The other day there was a librarian arrested because her boyfriend used to be in a bike gang, and she had lunch with her boyfriend, and so it was seen that she was associating with a member of a criminal gang, and the woman was arrested. This is ridiculous, folks, and this is how ridiculous it's gotten, and it's just going to get worse if the people can't put down their stuff with each other and reunite in some way, at least in a way of common respect. I'm not saying that they all need to march down the street together, but they need to unite in common unity with each other, in common respect for each other, because the fight is, is coming to the wire. It really is. The government is pushing you to the wire. They're pushing all of civilization to the wire, and they're seeing how far they can go before the people react. And if the people don't react before the prison is fully built, then once the prison is built, it's going to be very, very difficult to escape from. And it's being built around us right now. But it's happening mostly in a virtual world. It's happening electronically. And it's happening because of the idea that people have that legislation is real. So it's all fiction. Even the electronic world that they are immersing you into is a fictional world. It's not real. It doesn't exist. And the parameters that control that fictional world are controlled by another fictional paper-based world where they write all this stuff down and they create guidelines by which you have to live your life because you agree to be part of their system. And that's one of the most interesting things about this whole control grid that is being put in place, folks. Although there are physical aspects to it, like jails and bars on windows and doors and tasers and police batons and big burly offices. Still, it's a system that only exists in people's minds. And that is the most constraining part. For all the brute force that the police can throw at you, most of what they use to get that brute force from lies in the ether. 
It's a fictional reality. All of the rules are fiction. It's a paper-based world. They only get that power because they believe it is real and because you believe that it is real. And it's that belief itself which gives the system its power. But it's not real, folks. It's just a fiction. It's a meme. It's just an idea that that's how the world should be. But it doesn't have to be that way at all. It could be any way we want it to be once we rediscover the power of ourselves, once we awaken to our true potential and become what we are here to become, what we used to be and what we could easily become again were we to simply wake up from our slumber and see the potential that exists within the very vessel that you inhabit and the consciousness that controls that vessel. And, you know, there's all sorts of messages that are coming out now. Even in the movies, if you look at the movies and a lot of the TV shows, there's all these hidden messages of empowerment within these series now, within a lot of movies. A lot of the subtext, I think, has almost been put there to prompt people into wakefulness. Unfortunately, many people miss it. There's also other messages in the movies as well. But I think there are people within the inside of these industries that are putting things in there in an attempt to empower people. I really do feel that this is happening now. You know, everything I've done on these shows has been aimed in that direction right since the beginning. It's all been about offering you my perspective that I have of myself, really, and hoping that it will help you to find the truth about yourself. You know, even if you listen to the radio shows since I started in 2008, it's been a journey for me the whole way. And a lot of it I've shared with you, a lot of the growth over the last six years, I've shared with every listener out there who's tuned into the show. And it's been a growth for all of us. And we're seeing this right around the planet now. I think mankind truly is waking up to who and what we are, what we're capable of. But there is so much effort being undertaken to keep us down and hold us back. There's so much effort being undertaken to destroy what we have left of the ancient ways. The destruction that's happening in the Amazon, one of the main focuses of the Full Circle Project, is to try and save the Amazon. The loss of shamanism, the loss of ancient traditions, the loss of all of the old ways that we could be merging and we should be merging all of our modern ways with in order to create a viable future. We're losing all of this knowledge and we're losing all of our connection to the earth. We're getting lost in this cyber world that isn't real, this virtual world. And we've already been lost for a great deal of time within a paper-based legal world as well. And both are worlds of fiction. And this is what people are waking up to. And that's what this time in history is. It's a time when the fiction has been revealed, the great unveiling, the apocalypse. That's what the apocalypse is, after all. It's a time of great revealing. That's what it means. It's a time when the covers come off and the world reveals itself. And that's what we're seeing this year. There's a lot of revelations happening all around the world this year. There's a lot of things that are being revealed in all aspects. Aspects of the alternate research movement, in aspects of the government, aspects of the control system. There's so many things in place that are exposing themselves now. And that's what a lot of this year is about. So I think it's going to be a big year, folks. So hang on. I think we're in for a hell of a ride. But look, this is about it for me today. We've run out of time again, so I'm going to have to end the show here. Thank you very much for spending this time with me today. Thank you to anybody who has ever made a contribution to the Crow House. Thank you to all those who are getting involved in the Full Circle Project and have made contributions to the Inlock Cash Foundation, we really do need to create a fund to get this Amazon buyback going. And we've got a long way to go to do that, but that will be something that I hope to achieve this year as well. But that is it for me, ladies and gentlemen. I'm completely out of time. I'll look forward to speaking to you again next week. Please take good care until then. Inlock Cash. Cash.